It's a beautiful day here in Talberg, Sweden. We have gathered 500 of us from all corners of the world, from all types of, all walks of life. Many are scientists. We're here to take stock of the evolution of, of the situation for the planet. We are taking stock. We are defining what we call the planetary boundaries that we, the humans, should not transgress um, on such crucial issues as water, oceans, forests, and, and of course the atmosphere, global warming. Many analyses are represented here. Some are more optimistic, and some are less, less so. Um, one is uh, Professor David Weston, the leading British scientist. He has gathered his materials to tell you a, a worrying, very worrying story. I think this story is important to listen to. And for you, it's important to, to take your decision on how you want to react and how you should react, how you should act in relation to history. Well, good morning to you all, and thank you so much for the invitation to Tailberg 2008 and to the science workshop that preceded it. I'm immensely grateful to you, Boo, for the invitation and for making this possible. When Boo briefed me for the presentation today, he asked me, in fact, to be uh, radical. I wasn't quite sure I believed my ears when he said that, but I checked it out again 48 hours later. He said, yes, that's exactly what I mean. Stay radical. <laughs> He's always radical. Stay radical. Yeah. Uh, I think the boundaries of, of tolerable radicality <laughs> have to do with the anxiety states of scientists who dare not put their head above the parapet <laughs> and risk being wrong in public. So maybe it's something about courage and radicality go together, right? Now, to me, the word radical uh, probably means getting down to the root of the problem. Say it as it really is. And I will do that to the best of my ability. One of the things we need to be aware of in climate science is that there is a time delay between original research and publication of about three years. Original ideas come into being in the researcher's mind or, or from the data or the analysis or the modeling. And then that gets written up with a team into a paper that goes through a whole series of reviews. That then gets presented for a publication in an international journal. They may or may not accept it or put it on, on hold for a few months. Then it gets sent out to a set of anonymous reviewers, comes back, maybe re-edited, maybe sent out again, comes back, accepted, and then published perhaps two editions later. Then it's in the public domain. Oh, and then the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is able to pick up the material and put it through its 18 month to two year review, assembly, analysis, uh, editorial processes, out for peer review on that, back in again, out for another peer review on that, back in again, out to review through the governmental agents, back in again, and publication. So by the time the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was published in February 2007, it was about five years out of date. This is a real problem when the pace of change in the climate system is moving faster and faster and faster. It is now outpacing the delays in the publication system. The climate science group that convened for the two days before the, the forum, as some of you here will know, focused on the tipping points that we dare not cross, tipping points that push us into change that is intolerable for human civilization. The workshop was based on peer-reviewed material. 
and although perhaps two to three years in advance of the intergovernmental panel's work, it was still about two to three years behind the leading edge of current research. And my task today is to bridge the gap from the foundation that Johann Rockström laid and the others laid in that science workshop, and to bridge the gap from that platform to today's leading edge, some of which is work in hand, some of it only emerging in the last two or three weeks. Therefore, it's rough edged, it's workshop level, some of it will be polished and corrected. But I think it's important that you here today have the best possible chance to see where the leading edge is and where it's going. Planet Earth, we have a problem. You know, back in April 1970, in the Apollo space program, on the 13th of the month, there was an explosion on Apollo 13. And uh, you, perhaps those of you who are old enough here, and some of you are, as I am, can remember being glued to the television as the saga unfolded. And those laconic words from Jim Lovell, uh, Houston, uh, we have a problem. They're telling me they had a problem. Um, Gene Krantz, who was the mission controller at the time, reflects in his uh, storytelling of this. For about the first 15 minutes, we said, it's not a problem. This is a computer glitch. There's no problem out in space. We'll get this fixed. No, no problem. And it took them 15 minutes of precious time to realize there really was a problem, that the moon landing as a mission had to be aborted. The task now was survival. And that changed the whole function of the mission. Today, planet Earth is the space capsule and planet Earth is Houston Control. We're all in it together. And it's taken us more than 15 years to think that this may not just be a bit of a glitch that technologically we can patch together and no problem. Planet Earth, we have a problem. <laughs> 